Welcome to Stay Daily. Casey Porter here. So glad that you decided to tune in. Fans, today we have a very, very, very special guest. One of the best defensive players ever at Oklahoma State, and that is not an exaggeration. Stacy Satterwhite joins O State Daily. What an honor it is to get to talk to you, Stacy. Uh, this is just simply fantastic. How the heck are you? And thank you very much for joining. Oh, appreciate you doing these. Um, you know, doing great. Uh, uh, it uh, it's it's pretty nice to to be able to watch what you're doing and and see some of these interviews and and seeing what it means uh, to a lot of these guys to wear the jersey and wear the brand and. And I hope that uh, uh, some of the uh, guys that are playing now that we're having struggles with, I hope they, they would watch some of this and listen and, and uh, understand that it, it means something to represent the university. It means something to, to be on the field with that jersey. And you got to play hard every play. And hopefully uh, maybe some of these interviews will help bleed over. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. So let's have a little bit of a light moment here. Yeah. All right. 1991, you have you – have, Stacy Satterwhite, Oklahoma State. You got Joel Steed of Colorado and Dana Stubblefield of Kansas. So there's been a debate going on for almost 35 years now, uh, Stacy. Who was the best defensive lineman in the Big Eight in 1991? Well, I mean, if you look at it from, uh, uh, you know, if you look at it now, uh, you'd have to say uh, those guys were definitely better athletes than I was at the time, and I and. And, uh, you know, I had a great college career. I was, I was lucky and fortunate. Uh, I was a guy that studied a lot of film. I wasn't the best athlete, but I used great technique and, and uh, studied a lot of film and knew what was happening a lot of times before it happened. And so, but if you look at those guys, both those guys went on and had great NFL careers. Uh, really, when you, when you talk about when I was there, uh, the best defensive lineman on the field, probably in the Big Eight at the time, was Jason Gilden. Yes. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I think those two guys are, are great players. But, uh, you know, one of the guys I've been bringing up when I'm in Stillwater is, is Jason Gilden needs to be honored. Uh, was a great player for us when we weren't very good. Uh, you know, was undersized a little bit. People didn't know whether he could play or not. Man, I knew. Uh, yeah. When you played with him on the field, you knew this guy is special. Uh, was a great player, even though he played as a freshman undersized and and just was a difference maker. You knew he was going to go on and play in the league, and he did. Uh, I think he was with the Broncos and the Jags, but or not Broncos, but Pittsburgh Steelers, the Steelers and the Jaguar. And, uh, you know, he just uh, was a great player. So if, if I was to be honest with, with myself, the, the best defensive lineman on the field was Jason Gilden when I played. So. Yeah. So, um, uh, but, uh, yeah, those other guys were great players as well, and they went on and had good careers in the NFL. And I had a chance to go with the Broncos for a little while, but I was was a very uh, average athlete uh, and got injured up there. And, and, you know, you can't get injured when you're an average athlete and you're kind of on the bubble. So, uh, but the good Lord's blessed me, and and I had a great college career and and a great high school career and and have have, uh, had a, a great life up to now thanks to uh, those blessings so so you came from an eight-man school in welch oklahoma coach mcclure you guys had a great group of players that we're going to get into take us back to 1987 i know you had several college players on your team coach mcclure had it going talk about that time of your life yeah you know um, i was really fortunate to have a group of there was about three or four classes of us together uh, that were were really good in, in large classes and and uh, large for our school anyway. Yeah. And so by my, by the time I was a senior, you know, I had already been practicing and playing against some. There were some guys that went on and played small college football from those classes before me. So the standard of practice at our high school was at a probably much higher level than most high schools around, even eleven man. And so the last couple of years. Uh, especially my senior year, we didn't even scrimmage eight man. We scrimmaged eleven man teams before the season, and so we had a, a fullback that went on and played college football. We had a, a couple of the other. There's only three offensive linemen, and both of them, uh, including me, had uh, chances to play college football. We had a tight end that had a chance to play college football. We had another end that had a chance wow. to play college football that went on and played college baseball. So, I mean, there was four or five guys that. 
So we had grown up since second grade playing football, and um, uh, we were brothers. We're still like brothers. Uh, so, uh, you know, I was very fortunate to, to have that group around me. We held everybody accountable. Uh, if somebody didn't show up for workouts, they would come get you. Uh, and then, of course, you had Coach McClure, uh, very, very uh, old school, uh, didn't care who you were. It didn't matter that I was getting recruited by everybody. If, if I didn't do what I was supposed to do, I wasn't going to play. And that was backed by uh, my parents saying the same thing. I was just really lucky to have a set of parents that didn't, uh, that kept me grounded, that uh, made me very aware of where I came from and kept that in front of me the whole time I played football. And Coach McClure, um, you know, I have to give him so much credit because you think about in those days, uh, there wasn't a lot of help. And he brought in some help um, as assistant coaches that allowed us to do a lot of technique. So as I was growing up, I had really good three-point technique. I used my hands really well. I took great steps. I was able to read blocks, but we were taught that from junior high on. And so that gave me a a step, I was a step ahead when I got to OSU with some of the other guys because of my technique was already established in there. So Coach Mack was way ahead of his time, and that, that's what created so much success in our football program for many, many years there at uh, Welch. And I owe him a ton. I actually talked to him the other day about coming watching my nice. oldest son play. <laughs> so Nice. Nice. Your oldest son's getting recruited right now. We'll get into that here in a minute. But – yeah, there at Welch, hey, you know, the World Series, as we record this on Thursday afternoon, World Series ended last night. The Dodgers won uh, the, the World Series for 2024. So I only say that to say, you know, they've changed the radars and how fast guys throw. So rumor has it back in the day, back at Welch, Oklahoma, Stacy Satterwhite could hit 90, the old 90, not the new 90. Is that just a rumor or is that true? Well, that's what uh, – there was an Arkansas coach uh, came, and he was actually there to watch another young man uh, that went on to play that's college, how it always works. college baseball. <laughs> and uh, I was – I played baseball. I enjoyed playing baseball. I really played as much because my buddies played as, as I did anything. But I really enjoyed catching more than pitching. And so – um, it was my senior year, and coach wouldn't let me catch and because I'd already uh, – uh, decided to play football and so I pitched quite a bit and and they hit me at, at 90 and 91 that day um, and came over and invited me down to do a workout and uh, of course uh, I had already uh, committed to go play football at Oklahoma State but and you know I, I, I could throw really hard um, my oldest uh, could too and, and we had somebody teach him how to throw and it just made him better um, but uh, it, uh, I wish somebody could have taught me a little bit more about the mechanics like kids have the opportunity to learn now. But I still would have played football. <laughs> I mean, I was, was not a, a guy that wanted to eat and breathe baseball. I wanted to eat and breathe football. Being in a small school like that, there's a lot of advantages. You get to do a whole lot of different things. You got to play basketball too, didn't you? Yeah, we played everything. Uh, I actually uh, played basketball up until my senior year. Uh, actually got recruited a little bit of mm -hmm. playing basketball because I had a really good NEO tournament uh, my junior year. Uh, and, you know, had just small schools, really small schools uh, recruit me to play basketball, which uh, – um, uh, was always fun for me, but once again, we did it uh, to help our school, to rep, you know, help rep our school. Um, actually, my senior year, I even threw shot put, and I think I came in second in the state throwing oh, shot wow. put in it, and never knew how to really throw it. Yeah. Um, uh, Ronnie Fuller from Vanita actually uh, uh, taught me how to do it. Uh, I went over and seen him, and he was really good at throwing a shot and a discus, and he kind of taught me how to throw it. So um, yeah, we, uh, you know, we did what the coaches asked us to do. Uh, you know, back then it was important. I still think it's important to play multi sports uh, in high school, um, and and I think that allows you to be more athletic. Uh, and so I've, I've, I've promoted my boys to play multi-sports. Yeah, so. 100%. And, you know, hey, you hear this eight-man Welch. It's a town of about 700 people, very, very, very small. So you think underdog with Stacy Satterwhite. And there is an element to that, but you were recruited by all the blue chip programs. You went to a camp right before your senior year at OU. You blew the camp up. 
you turned all the heads. So you had a lot of attention. So Oklahoma State had to fight you off of a lot of really bigger schools. So knowing that, why choose OSU? Well, I, I, you know, I um, I went and visited uh, Notre Dame, OU, Tulsa, and OSU. I uh, had an opportunity. Uh, I got I got letters from the majority of schools in the Division One level at that time. Uh, told a few conferences I wasn't interested in coming down there. Uh, the, the Southeast Conference was was pretty crazy back then, and lots of crazy things going on. Um, but kind of narrowed it up that way. And, um, you know, Coach Coker uh, was the main lead uh, that recruited me. Uh, really liked Coach Campbell, who was the defensive coordinator when I came. Uh, just felt uh, from a gut feeling, uh, felt at home there, felt like that's where the good Lord wanted me to go. And uh, uh, I made that decision against a lot of the majority, in all honesty. You know, um, yeah, it uh, – uh, the Owens family is, is um, yes. my mom uh, was real close to Dale uh, and uh, Steve Owens Tinker, Owens' sister. So I knew them. Um, you know, my coach, I think he had a favorite he, he wanted me to go to, but she stayed pretty neutral for me. I know, I know my parents were where my parents wanted me to go, and it might not have been where everybody wanted me to go, but it's where I felt like I was led to go. And what a great, what a great choice it was. And I'm yeah. so happy that I did that. Uh, and it was it was it was crazy back then. I mean, uh, over 300 phone calls one day, you know, trying to figure out wow. during the dead period from newspapers and everything else, trying to figure out where I was going. And wow. uh, uh, my dad was trying to work midnights at the time. And so we had a black dial rotary phone and we had to take it un and plug it completely. Yeah. Because it was just, you know, it's one of the things if you took the phone off the hook, it'd start screaming at you. So yeah. we just had to learn how to unplug it completely so he could even sleep. You mentioned Steve Owens, legendary OU football player. Grew up right down the street. I should say Larry Reese grew up right down the street from him. So, yes. Larry Reese, Miami, Oklahoma, I know you guys are very similar of age, maybe one or two years apart from each other. But you were buds in high school. I mean, you guys you guys are foxhole guys. I mean, you're like really, really good friends. So, talk about that relationship with Larry Reese. Yeah, you know, I met Larry Reese, uh, you know, of course, in high school. And, and we played a lot of our games on Thursday night. So, uh, a lot of times, a lot of the other teams would come to our games and follow us on Thursday nights. And then we would go to Miami and watch Miami play on Friday nights. And, and so, we've, we've known each other since high school. And then, um, uh, you know, became close friends in college and have continued to be close friends. Uh, uh, my grandfather always talked about the – you know, your, your real good friends are people you've taken a foxhole with, and he's definitely one of my foxhole friends. Uh, he uh, uh, is like a brother to me, would do anything for him. And, uh, uh, you know, it was crazy, but uh, he became the voice of the Cowboys, I think it was my senior year. Yeah, and, I know. Uh, um, I think there towards the last of the season is when he kind of took full the full reins of it. And, and I always give him a hard time because my senior, my senior year, my senior game, if you would have counted all the times he said my name uh, on tackles, I'd have probably had the career game high tackles of 30 because it seemed like he was saying my name enough that even some of the guys on the sidelines were saying, do you know that guy? <laughs> And so, yeah, it's a, uh, yeah, I've known him a long time and, and would do anything for him. And he, there's nobody bleeds more orange than that man. I mean, he is full-fledged uh, Oklahoma State. And what he has done, um, you know, his part in, in, the, in what he has done there is, is uh, uh, you just can't, uh, you can't deny. Uh, it, it's, you, know, you can't put a dollar figure on it, even sure. what his worth has been to the university. No doubt. Hey, if memory serves me correct, 1988, you come into Oklahoma State with four, three other defensive linemen. I think there were four defensive linemen recruits total in that class as far as scholarship offers go. But you were the only one that was ready to make an impact as a true freshman, of which you did your true freshman year, though. And so let me let me ask you this. You know, hey, you're you're in eight man football one year, and then 300 days later. You're going up against the War Pigs, which was all veteran offensive linemen, 1985, Mike Wolf and all those guys. And you're trying to tackle Barry Sanders in practice, right? 
I mean, that had to be a, as prepared as Coach McClure had you. That had to be a big leap. It was. It was a big leap. Um, you know, um, I tell people this all the time. Uh, I think playing eight man football prepared me both uh, from a conditioning standpoint as well as a speed standpoint because things happen on an eight man field a lot faster than they do on an 11 man field and at the high school level i'm not going to say that on a college level and so your reaction time and things like that uh, has to be quicker and so when i got there i don't think the speed of the game affected me as much as it did some of the other guys um, you know, try, you're just never going to tackle Barry Sanders unless it's an accident. And then if you tackle him with an accident, you got to run up to the top of the stands for the rest of practice. So, um, yeah, that was, that was a different, different league. And it was funny about that is uh, I went the spring of my summer or spring of my senior year, went and watched Oklahoma State practice. And I kept telling my, my dad at the time, I kept telling him, that, you know, Dad, there's a guy better than Thurman there. You know, there's, there's a guy better. And uh, he's kept telling me, oh, that can't be, can't be. And then, you know, here bust out Barry Sanders when I get there as a freshman. Uh, because I went there that spring and they weren't tackling him in spring practice right. at all. I mean, he was just running around. And he looked like, you know, you're just wondering where did he come from kind of thing. And, and um, but yeah, it was a, it was a big step. I think being, being, having the technique base that I had really helped me step in and do some things that maybe I wouldn't have been able to do if I didn't have that, the coaching at the high school level. And I was in great shape. I was in great, I was scared to death. You know, and so I, I trained and trained and trained and was in great shape coming in. So I think those two things helped me be able to step in there when there was a few other things happened that allowed me to step forward and be the next man. You got worked in kind of slow. Now, you did get to play as a true freshman. You got your first start, though, your true freshman year, 1988, against Kansas. So do you have a moment to where you remember when one of the coaches came up and told you you were starting that day? Do you well, remember jogging on the field as a starter, any, any of that kind of stuff? I, uh, I can tell you what happened. Uh, uh, I uh, normally, uh, the, inf the we always had a press luncheon on Mondays, I believe yeah. it was. And Steve Buzzard was yeah. trying to get me to go to the press luncheon. And I didn't know I was starting. And so I was like, I've got other things I need to do. And he said, no, you don't understand. You've got to go to the press luncheon today. And then he finally told, told me, he said, they're going to announce that you're going to start for the game today. Oh, really? So, so I honestly did not. And, and they may have told me earlier, earlier, uh, like on a Sunday evening or something. Wow. Maybe I didn't understand that's what was happening. But I really didn't understand until I walked into the media there that they, uh, they that I was starting. And Coach Jones announced that I was starting. And, and so – uh, yeah, it was a it was an eye opening experience, and then uh, had a very uh, rough week of practice. Yeah, um, Coach Wallstead yeah. uh, pushed me to my wits end, and and really, uh, you know, I'm going to start, and had me to where I was, I was you know, fighting mad yeah. uh, because of how hard they were pushing me. But, you know, I look back now and I was just like, thank goodness that guy helped me grow in that next week or two because it enabled me. He pushed me at a level I'd never been. And it enabled me to uh, be able to play at that level. And I'd take a bullet for him. Uh, Coach Wallstead was, was uh, instrumental in, in getting me to where I needed to be able to be successful as a football player in college. And, um, it, but yeah, I tell you, it was pretty rocky there for, for especially that first week uh, before I started because they were really pushing, 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 pushing. And they pushed me over the edge a few times. And, and, but it, it, it uh, I look back at it now and if they would not have done that, I might not have made it. I may not right. have been able to perform like that, but they just made me play at such a higher level. And, and, and uh, I was already a pretty physical football player and light contact, but it made me that much more physical. So we mentioned all the, the offers that you had, all the people you were in contact with, whenever you chose to come to Oklahoma State. So you come to Oklahoma State at its peak, 1988, and we have aspirations of Orange Bowls and winning national titles, that kind of thing. By 1991, it's 0-10-1. So you could have went – I mean, as much as you're recruited coming out of high school, you, you were one of the best defensive linemen in the country. I'm sure you could have transferred 
any time you wanted to any school you wanted, basically, at that time. So why choose to stay? Well, you know, um, you know, back then they weren't allowed to contact you, but you, you, it was made known to you that you had opportunities, and and I, I could have went a lot of places, and uh, you know, had those discussions with my father, and you know, my dad was uh, a big about being uh, a man of your word, and uh, you know, he he told me, you know, I about uh, commit, I about committed early to another school because I was kind of enamored with it. I never had been on a recruiting visit before, a little town of Welch, Oklahoma. Yeah. And he said, you know, you gave all these other schools your word, you need to go visit. And that led to me in ending up at Oklahoma State. And so uh, when we discussed this, he he's like, uh, you know, these people have uh, you know made a commitment to you and you made a commitment to them and you need to stay true to your word and if something crazy goes haywire or they don't honor their side of it then we'll talk about it and so i've i've even said that to my boys today um with the environment that's in today is is um you know you know, you know maybe it's not the same coaching staff or there's a reason to transfer but if you're making this commitment make the commitment to be there for four or five years and have a great career mm -hmm. and and because it it benefited me to stay and granted we were 10 and one my senior year but there was lots of things i learned out of that lots of friendships that i made Absolutely. lots of uh of of respect that i earned because i did stay true to the, the the brand i did stay true to my word and to my commitment to the university and i still believe that i think that's something that's forgotten um it's it's you know i, I still think kids got to understand to play football at a high level it's got to mean something other than the dollars it's got to right. mean something other than the dollars and and so uh, there's a lot of kids chasing dollars when they ought to be chasing who is going to invest time in me, who is going to make me a better man, a better person, as well as a better football player. And that's what gets you to the NFL. It's not how much money they're going to pay you in college. 100%. And you had a coach to kind of follow that pattern to because the 80s at Oklahoma State started with Jimmy Johnson, you know, 83, 84, 85. Those were seasons where Oklahoma State had national championship aspirations it finishes with uh, the heisman trophy in 1988 and so at that point pat jones with with the probation coming down i'm sure he could have went anywhere he wanted but he chose to stay with oklahoma state through the probation like you did so talk about what it was like to play for pat jones you know pat was a defensive guy and yeah. a lot of times we spend the majority of time on our end of the field and that was not always good if everybody wasn't wasn't getting after it because he he wanted you to be physical he wanted you to be at a high level and so i think as as uh, probation went on and and we, our, our inability to recruit uh some of the competition on the field got less and less and i think that really bothered pat um and so uh, he got more intense at times, uh, uh, especially our senior year, because we were really good on defense. I mean, if you look back at the guys that were there my senior year, you had Jason Gildon who played in the NFL. You had Mike Clark who had a chance to go play in the NFL. You had Joe King who played in the NFL. You had me who had a chance. I mean, you had five or six guys on that on that defense. Jay Fleshman would yeah. have played in the NFL if he would not have blew his knee out. I'm telling you. Yeah. One of the only guys that uh, would tell me he was going to knock somebody out that would go knock somebody out. One of the most physical people that I've ever played or seen play the game of football. And, and uh, yeah, you know, he would have. So we were really talented. I think talented. he did knock that guy of Florida out that one. Yeah, he said he yeah. was going to, and I think he did. Yeah, he uh, – I, I'd like to watch that film again, but he, he was going at it with uh, a guy at the Florida. I'm pretty sure it was at Florida, and he came back and told us he was going to knock him out, and then he did knock him out, and then he almost started a riot on the field. So, and, and uh, that was, you know, Steve Spurrier's first – I believe it was his first game, and, and uh, it didn't go well for us. But uh, we were we were we were getting after him on defense. Yeah. So. yeah, absolutely. Hey, what do you remember about Mike Gundy? You got to play with him one year there in 1988, and now you get to see him as a coach. Anything surprise you? What do you remember him as a player? What do you think of as a coach? He was. A, I, I I thought he was a great leader. Um, you know, we weren't real good on defense uh, that year in 88. We struggled. We were real young. Uh, you know, we were starting at the end of the year. You had Fleshman, me, and Clark. And, and so you started three true freshmen. Uh, 
um, and and uh, we we played well at times, but we didn't we weren't as consistent as maybe we needed to be. And so Mike, we would you know give up a couple big plays. Mike would always come down there and say, "Hey, we got you, we got you." You know, just get them stopped once. Get us get us a stop here. Get us another stop here. And so you always believed him because they always went out there. Of course, he had yeah. Barry and he had Hartley and he had you know Kirksey on one side and Cadillac on the other. So I mean, he had a lot of, a lot of weapons and and then you have the war pigs in front of you. And those guys were big mentors for me coming in as a freshman as well. Um, you know, they seen that I was going to get a chance uh, uh, and, and need to play. And those guys really took me aside and, and worked with me some too as well as a, as a person and a player. And I owe those guys a, a, a bunch as well because – and they still mean a lot to me because I came in there, you know, uh, as a freshman not really knowing – how to do it and, and even though sometimes they weren't real happy with me after one-on-ones you know they still counseled me or said hey do, you don't do that or you don't you know yeah. they, they gave me the little ins and outs that i needed to be successful so what do you think about the program mike gundy boone pickens everybody has built in the last 20 years and then yeah. this year's team it's it's really uh, it means a lot to me because I still remember being under Gallagher, you know, uh, no telling what the dust that was floating around underneath oh, yeah. there, and the baseball team would be hitting in the middle, and we're working out around the outer edges of it, and and I go there and I look at it today, and uh, it, it's amazing what these these young men have and how they're able to prepare themselves for the next level and how. Uh, they have the best of the best, and it, it means something to me because I was there when they were talking about shutting the program down. I mean, yeah, I, you know, right. really, I've had this conversation before. If there was eight or ten or even eleven of us would have walked away and left, uh, they would have struggled to have a team because we, my senior year, we didn't have but maybe seventy kids out. I mean, there wasn't very many kids out playing, and so uh, and everybody called it the death penalty, and we'd never recover. So. Uh, you know, I I really look at it as uh, it means it means a ton to me to go back and see that happening. I'm excited it's happening. I think what Mike has done uh, and the success Mike has had over the years is tremendous. But I think it's it has to do with being consistent, uh, having consistent leadership, consistent coaching. Um, I don't always agree with them, you know, sure. but, but I, exactly. you can't you can't argue with what has happened there and the level of play and how it's how, you know, uh, you know, T. Boone's Pickens making the donation and being able to build facilities to compete on a national level. And then uh, that helps your recruiting. Uh, you know, they've got the best facilities, the best of everything. Um, and, and it's a great atmosphere. And our fans are loyal. Um, most of our fans aren't fly-by-nighters. I would say 90% of our fans are, are tied to the university in some yep. way. And, right. and it's just a different atmosphere. And so I, I love it. It, I, it. The hair is still, when I go watch a game, the hair is still curls up on the back of my neck. And, and you know, I still say, give me a helmet, let me play one play kind of thing, you know. But mm -hmm. uh, I, I just, I, I'm very proud of it. But I also know it means something to wear that jersey. Uh, and it meant something to me. And, uh, you know, that's what I hope it means to this team. I hope we don't forget that. Um, when you look at uh, the struggles that they've had lately, I, I see a lot of confidence. They're playing with a lack of confidence. Yes. And I think, you know what, um, we went in every game my senior year. There, I have a hard time um, listening uh, to players uh, because we went every week knowing we were hamstrung worse than any other college team in the country with the probation that they gave us. And, um, you know, we still went out and we fought every week. And I fought for Mike Clark. I fought for the Jay Fleshmans. I fought for the Brandon Colbers. I fought for the Jason Gildens. I fought for the Josh Eretz on on the offensive line. You know, we fought for each other. And, that's, and, and we fought for our – alumni and we fought for our fans and and that's why we we played and that's why we stayed and they got to remember that uh and that will bring some energy that will bring some things uh and if you take it that if it's that important you're going to study the film you're going to do the things you need to be to make that play that needs to be made to turn that thing on its edge so I just hope that, uh, you know, I, I wish they'd watch some of these interviews and see what it means 
and, and, and realize, hey, the, the brand means something. And so uh, I hope uh, that that energy comes back and that uh, let's run to the ball, let's chase the ball, let's do those things that could make an extra stop or an extra recover an extra fumble or give our offense an extra chance. And in same way on the offensive side, make that extra block downfield, do those extras uh, and, and wear, the, wear the brand. 100%. That is a great message, Stacy. I really appreciate you saying that. That is just absolutely awesome. Because I got to see, you know, 1991 was my first year on campus. So I got to see it with my own eyes. I grew up in Stillwater, so I was just diehard. So I know exactly what you're talking about. Every time that we would leave after a loss, like the TCU game at home, that was so close and back and forth. And you're like, oh, I thought we we're going to win that. You still left the stadium every week, proud to be an Oklahoma State fan. Because every single OSU player put their everything on the line. Yeah, we, you know, we were close in a lot of games. I mean, we were close up to the, I think the end of the third quarter against OU. Yeah, uh, and just couldn't stick the ball in the in, in the in the end zone there on fourth and one. Um, you know, we were, but we went back out the next week and played hard the next week. I mean, a lot of people probably don't remember, but I believe it was that year when we. Uh, we held, uh, I think Colorado had to uh, do a fake field goal to win the football game that year. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but we went out the next week and we played that hard the next week. And so uh, that's, you just got to keep stacking days. My son gets tired of my, both of my sons get tired of hearing me say that. You just got to keep stacking days. You got to keep going out there and putting the hours in and getting better. And, and th good things will happen if you do that. Uh, if, if you get the doubt in your system, you get the doubt in your teammates, or you get the doubt in what you're doing, you're not going to play well. You're not going to run to the ball. You're not going to finish the block. You're not going to do the thing. So it's very important to, to keep going back out there and fighting. Um, and, you know, looking to the guy next to you, I mean, they used to have to pour me out of that locker room because I would be so wore out. Uh, Robert Allen would come up and want to interview me, and I'm like, dude, come back after you get done with everybody else because I was just wore out. And, and a lot of us would be. Uh, so um, that's, that's the way uh, I hope uh, they continue the rest of the season with that kind of attitude because – uh, that's what, what it needs to, to work yourself out of a situation that we are in. You mentioned your two boys. I believe your oldest went to Kansas, and then now your youngest is playing for Owasso and is getting recruited as well. So you want to talk about them? Yeah, my oldest, uh, he uh, um, actually had a, a back injury, kept him out of a year in, in high school football, so his recruiting was late. Uh, and he – OSU recruited him pretty hard, but they had already had five offensive linemen committed. So he ended up at KU um, and was doing really well there, uh, had another injury. So he ended up uh, be becoming a student coach and now is an assistant offensive line coach there at KU uh, and graduated nice. with over a 3.8 3 from their business school. I'm very proud of that um, uh, because – I always made it important. I was an academic All-American. I wanted my boys to be as well. And my, my youngest is having a great senior year at Owasso. Um, you know, he's a – he's everybody calls him a tweener, uh, but he's a football player. And um, he's very educated. He does great technique, has great run fits. And, and so he's, he's uh, already committed to Lindenwood College, probably has some other opportunities maybe in the wings. Uh, but, uh, you know, he's got a great opportunity to go get his school paid for and do what he loves, and, and he's blessed to, to have that as well. So, uh, But he's on a very good football team that's underestimated, and, and I hope they stay that way um, because <clears throat> they've kind of came out and nobody expected them, but they're a bunch of uh, kids that are working hard. I mean, uh, we've had a group of defensive linemen uh, working together now for almost two years, and it's, it's showing on the field. You mentioned that he's at Owasso. Hey, I want to get one more thing. We started with a light moment. I want to finish with a light moment. 1987, Jay Fleshman playing safety for Sand Springs. Eight-man game versus Welch. Who wins? 
Uh, I would have to say, uh, our, if, if it was an eight-man oh. game, if uh, it was uh, an eight-man uh, uh, game, I would say that Welch would win. So I love it. Uh, I we, love uh, it. you know, Fleshman can't win an eight-game eight-man game by himself, and uh, I had seven other dudes that could play at a high level uh, that would uh, push me. So I'm I'm betting on Welch Wildcats on uh, it versus the Sandites uh, in a, in an eight-man game uh, back in the day. So. Absolutely awesome. That is fantastic. Stacy Satterwhite, I can't tell you how big of an honor this has been. I have had so much fun getting to listen to you talk, getting to talk to you. Thank you so much for joining us, Day Daily. Hey, thank you for having me, and it's been an enjoyment, and go Pokes.